Light within my heart, light within my thoughts, light within my words. May one and all and everything, blessed and loved, ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. Within these shows, I share my perceptions, my conclusions I come to through extended contemplation trying to think deeply about things and look below the surface and see, yes, but what does it mean and how does it work and why is it the way it is? And how do we understand it in a way that makes it empowering rather than debilitating, that gives us reason to hope and love and be wise rather than reasons to fear and feel weak and depressed and manipulated. Someone requested that I contemplate the experience of death and dying and it's problematic of course because it's not like this is an experience you can go do and come back and report what it was like there have been people who were resuscitated after dying and they have written books on the subject and what they perceived and their experience and so forth and i think it's all wonderful and there may even be some common threads between them but the thing to remember is that one can never have somebody else's experience. You can only have your own experience. And what someone else perceived or experienced may or may not be exactly what you will experience. Even in going to see something as simple as a movie in a cinema, if I go and see the movie, I come out with a very different report than perhaps anyone else who could have gone with me to see the movie at the same time. So that even though we're watching the same, uh, the same projection on the screen, we're surrounded by the same group of other potentially distracting audience members, we get there after waiting in the same line for tickets and going through whatever frustrations we might have encountered trying to get our uh, some refreshments from the concession stand and we, we get there and as much as possible from the point we arrived at the theater until the end of the movie we've had the same experience and yet we don't come out reporting the same perception of the movie that we both saw. In a similar sort of way it seems to me that the process of, of death and dying must be an incredibly individual sort of experience. The thing to bear in mind, though, is that these are just my personal opinions and speculations. Uh, I was discussing with someone the other day the existence of God, and this was a person who identified as an atheist. And I finally said to him, God does not magically leap into being just because some cleric says so, nor does God suddenly cease to exist just because an atheist screams as loud as he or she can, I don't believe in you. Whatever is, is, what we believe about it changes our relationship to it. But it doesn't change the reality that is available for discovery. But even as we discover it, the way we experience that discovery will probably be completely unique from the way someone else experiences that discovery. 
we will have our own perceptions, draw our own conclusions, bring our own personal mythology to it, bring our own beliefs about spirituality to it. But in that death and dying and the divine are all things that are ultimately beyond human comprehension. We come up with ideas that help us relate to those things positively, or as positively as we can, and if God is concerned about us believing something different, then God has the freedom to manifest something different. If God chooses not to, who am I to argue for that person having the results of an experience that he or she did not have? If I or anyone else were to make a speculation of what you will see in death and dying and somebody goes through some medical incident in which they, uh, for all essential purposes, die and are resuscitated, and they report seeing something very differently, it doesn't mean they're wrong, it doesn't mean that I'm wrong. It means that we had different perceptions and different experiences. All we can really say is that this person's experience does not confirm my speculations, my the ways that I have envisioned uh, a particular experience or place or perception. In getting through day-to-day -day life and in dealing with these horrendous challenges, there is clearly still a need for us to come to terms with those mysteries in whatever ways we experience to be empowering. And so I will share with you the ways that I've devised and I hope they are helpful to you. If they're not, let them go. In all of my shows, if you hear something or see something that is helpful, that's the part to hang on to. If it's not helpful, let it go. It's for somebody else. It's not for you. Beginning, first of all, with pets, uh, since that's something that many people have gone through many, many times. In trying to understand how this uh, dog, for example, that I have known for quite a number of years and we have clearly expressed love for each other he's he was always so excited every time I came home every time we got to do anything together as long as we were together everything in his world was okay and every time we were apart he was worried about me and experienced all kinds of anxiety and he demonstrated that in his behavior the, the wonderful thing about dogs in comparison to people is that they are so incredibly honest I, I don't think it occurs to a dog to ever lie to uh, its master or companion, whichever term you want to use. I, I guess you could consider me to have been my dog's master, not because I controlled everything, but because he was my responsibility and because I, he would respond to certain commands. But I didn't want to get into micromanaging his life. I. I wanted us to have the happiest and most mutually empowering relationship that we could. I considered his safety and his food and water and his place to sleep at night, all those things were my responsibility. Uh, it would have been wrong for me, I believe, to abdicate that responsibility and let him go running out the door facing all kinds of dangers he could not possibly understand. When his time had come, however, and one morning quite unexpectedly, he had a really severe stroke and suddenly found himself unable to stand up. Um, and, you know, as he leaned against the side of a filing cabinet and slid to the floor, and, and I knew it was serious and I couldn't get any response. And the only thing that made sense was to uh, carry him to my car and, and get to the vets. Uh, the veterinarians as quickly as possible. She did an examination and ultimately said everything that she saw indicated the occurrence of a really severe stroke. And there were different things that could be tried in an experimental sort of way, but there was no 
there's no way of fixing what was wrong at that point. And so I needed to recognize that he would have, that even in a best case scenario, he would have no quality of life and I needed to let him go. And I made sure that I was with him to the very, very end, stroking his head as he slipped away and took his last breath. And it was very, very difficult for me. And I, I don't know if I've ever gotten over it, but I guess more so because he was also one of only two dogs I've had in my life who had demonstrated the ability to see ghosts. And that's a whole other story. But uh, we loved each other so much. And as I was trying to come to terms with his passing, and that ultimately it had to be my choice to release him from uh, ongoing suffering, that there was really nothing to look forward to. And it was uh, a merciful sort of thing to say, I love you, goodbye, I hope we see each other again someday. In scientific objective reality, is there an energy of the soul that goes someplace? Well, some people have said that they have weighed a human body before and after death, and there really is a measurable difference, as if something has departed, some energy or, or something, because it doesn't push down on the scale as much. I'm not interested in arguing that point right now, but what I came to understand, I guess, or what I choose to believe, there is a, an anecdote, an explanation given called the Rainbow Bridge that I find very comforting. I, I still find very comforting. The idea that there is a rainbow bridge between heaven and earth and it's where people get to meet their pets uh, when the people themselves have finally passed on as well. The idea of that we will be together again someday somehow makes the parting and that last goodbye, or the last temporary goodbye, I guess, um, you know, goodbye until we see each other at the Rainbow Bridge. It makes it more manageable for a human mind and heart to have hope in that sort of eventual reunion. Whether it will happen or not is not so much the question as to what extent it allows us to live with greater and wisdom while we are still here. My dog didn't need any greater wisdom or love. He already had everything that he needed. But in that final moment, what I interpret about pets is that what fuels the journey over the Rainbow Bridge is surrounding the animal with love in its final moments. That if uh, my dog or a cat or a pet or, or any such animal knows that it is loved, it can go to the Rainbow Bridge and make the transition in a peaceful and ultimately happy way. A sadness at parting, but a happiness that all sufferings are now at an end. And the veterinarian did tell me that as she was administering the euthanasia, she says it doesn't happen every time, uh, but she had a very clear sense that as she uh, inserted the needle, uh, the dog looked up at her and had this expression on his face as if to say thank you. Um, that he was not going to be trapped in a body that would no longer do what he wanted it to do. And I thanked her for sharing that with me. Um, but my only point in all that is to say that if what fuels an animal's journey to the Rainbow Bridge is being surrounded by love in its final moments, how could it be any less so for uh, human beings? Such that what a person needs most in those final moments as the last breath is approaching is to know that they are loved, that they will be missed, that, that they will be remembered, that they have experienced genuine love and that they have been able in some way or another to communicate genuine love to others. That someone might say to them, I know you love me because you did this or said this or because you were always this presence in my life. And as the person is surrounded by love and knows that in some sense their life has been characterized by love to some greater small degree, even if it's just for a few minutes in the final moment, to 
to grab a hold of some energy of love that that fuels the journey to the other side and allows a passing a transition from a physical realm to a spiritual realm to be peaceful and empowering rather than debilitating that all the sufferings and the limitations and the things that the body can't do will be left behind that when the body is left behind that elusive dream of which so many people have spoken of being able to fly to just get up out of their chairs and fly across the room and fly up through the clouds and do somersaults without worrying about gravity a spirit can do all of those things because the spirit is not bound by gravity and so there may be a sense in which if we could see what the spirit is doing that at the moment of the last breath with or without wings the spirit of the person rises into the air and begins to soar like a bird and, and the energy, the power by which that soaring is possible is the energy of love that was given to that person in the final moments. One of the laws of physics says that energy is neither created nor destroyed, it simply changes form and place. If there is an energy thus that is responsible for my unique consciousness, that energy must go somewhere. Just to say it is dissipated into nothingness, well, nothingness is perceptual. If you could look at the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest pieces, there really isn't any such thing as disappearing into nothingness. It is simply a question of whether uh, an energy or form is so diluted that it becomes more and more difficult to see the pieces of it. But it's not that it's gone, it's not that it ceases to exist. It is somewhere, some would say, waiting to be recollected into a new form. Maybe in a spiritual sense it stays together in a concentrated form that is simply invisible to human eyes. These are speculations that I feel no need to disallow because I have no way of proving they don't exist. Nor are they speculations that I want to adamantly proclaim as if it made any difference whether someone believes in them or not. Whether someone says God doesn't exist or whether someone says God does exist, either God exists or God doesn't. What remains is for each person to discover whatever is manifested to that person and if life is ultimately about the growth of the soul the growth of that unique consciousness that would be who I am regardless of what body or time or place or situation I found myself in that energy of my unique way of perceiving and thinking and feeling and experiencing and remembering the thing that makes everyone special is not whether you're gay or straight or man or woman or young or old or what race you are. The thing that makes every single individual special is that it's like a gift from God or the universe, depending on how you define it. For a limited amount of time, this particular way of living and experiencing and perceiving and expressing is given to the world and we can celebrate it, nurture it, share it, magnify it, or we can repress it, shove it aside, silence it, terminate it prematurely, which of course makes no sense. When you're given a gift from the universe, it would make sense to make the best possible use of it that you can. Because in each person, is a way of learning and perceiving and understanding that has never existed before and will never exist again. Even if, following the theories of reincarnation, even if that spirit were to come back in a new form, because of that new form it would perceive everything completely differently all over again. If life is primarily about the growth of the soul, having multiple lives would be a way that could contribute to soul growth, but, but no two growth experiences would be exactly the same. 
even if I go back to something, to some place where I went through an experience and I try to experience it all over again, just exactly the way it happened that time, I can't because I am coming to it with an additional collection of memories and experiences and a deeper understanding than I had the first time I went through it. I cannot re-experience the same thing in the same way. Susan Boyle can never go back and re-experience that moment of being discovered on the stage when she first sang, uh, I dreamed a dream in times gone by. That was a pivotal moment in her life as a professional singer. She can never go back to the innocence that she had before that and perform that song with the same innocence that she had on stage that day. It is my sincere hope and I think a reasonable belief that she grew enormously by what unfolded in response to her creative expression that day that in singing a song with such power and totally amazing everyone who expected so little from her. It sets a, a metaphor and a motif for each of us that in each moment of our lives the world may be underestimating us drastically. We can still, in whatever opportunities we are given, step to the front of the stage and sing what is in our hearts and speak what is in our hearts and, and paint or engineer or demonstrate or dance what is in our hearts and make it the best that we can do because if we don't the universe will never get another opportunity for that to happen. In approaching death and dying it really becomes kind of a mirror where we get to look back on what kind of life have we lived. And yet, it's not exactly a mirror, because even if we have not done well, we can still make a change to love, even in our final moments. And we can accept that, well, I learned a lot about doing things the wrong way. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to have learned all of that. And I'm grateful for the people who are willing to tolerate me through all those very difficult learning experiences. And now I hope that I will move on to something much better and make good use of that raw material of, of memories and experiences that I have accumulated here. If one can be surrounded by, loved and, by, by love and by loved ones in those final moments and use all of that to fuel the journey to the other side, that's a validation that not everyone gets and something for which to be very rightly thankful. The universe, or God, depending on what, upon which understanding you choose to embrace, has been doing the process of life and death for thousands of years. Is there anything more? I guess we'll find out. If there isn't, then we really have nothing to worry about. If there is, I choose to reach for the most positive and empowering and beautiful possibilities because there is nothing to be gained by embracing someone's negative expectations or by looking in the mirror and saying I was a bad person. Every single person who has ever lived has made mistakes and has done some things wrong and has had relationships that they were never able to get right either because the other persons involved wouldn't cooperate or because there was some deeper understanding that they just couldn't quite grasp, whatever it was. But if we come to each of those things with an honesty and an openness and accept that I am here to learn and I will learn from my accomplishments or I will learn from my mistakes or I will learn from other people's mistakes or other people's accomplishments. I will learn from whatever crosses my path. And if we have committed ourselves to being fully alive in the sense of learning from whatever crosses our path, that our consciousness has been given every opportunity to share its best contributions and to express the best that it had to give to the world around, to the surrounding world. That 
even even acknowledging that is a kind of love for oneself to look at oneself in a mirror for the last time and say there were a lot of things you didn't understand but I know you did your best there's no reason to be afraid there is something bigger than you and I whether it's the universe in its incredibly precise balanced complexity or God in some divine construction or, or conception that no church or religion has ever been able to fully encompass or fully describe. I choose to believe in God, but I spell the word G-O-D-D-E because it's not about the patriarchal notions that I was taught growing up, and it's not about flipping to the other side and saying, well, it must all be female then. The male and female terms may have very little to do with what is the actual reality of the divine. For myself, God is the embodiment of highest wisdom and greatest love. And the more I open to that and choose to embrace it, whether it comes to me as scientific knowledge or as anthropomorphic experience, uh, I think that which is truly God is able to be whatever anyone needs. Uh, to be a scientific insight, or to be uh, an angelic person, or to be... If God is truly limitless because of being the embodiment of highest wisdom and greatest love, then God can be whatever you need, whatever I need, whatever any of us needs, especially in our final moments. The point is to open to love and to move toward whatever bridge is placed before you. I hope these thoughts have been helpful to you. If someone is facing a terminal illness, I, I pray that you will find peace, that you will find love, and that in all you have learned in this lifetime, you will find meaning that can carry you through whatever questions may surround you at the end. Don't be afraid of the questions. Let them teach you. And know that Love is part of every healing process and every transition out of this life. And the more we can embrace love for self, love for others, or feel the love of others, the better the transition will be. Thank you for watching.